Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden. And I'm Christina Hoff Summers. You didn't do it the way I expected you to. And I'm Christina Hoff Hoff Summers. And we are joined in the studio by Ella Ryder. Welcome, Ella. Thank you. Ella is going to be our new Zoe. Zoe. Zoe's leaving us next week. It's a big mic to fill, Ella. (laughs) But uh, she's also equally young, so we're not losing the iGen... Vo- point of view. Point of view, thank goodness. Uh, you represent your entire generation of women, as you know. That's your role here. <laughs> and she's an NYU graduate, my alma mater. I am, 2017. What did you specialize in? Uh, I did the liberal studies program. So it's a four-year program, and then you are required to study abroad for a year. So I was in Shanghai. You're in uh, Shanghai. Mm-hmm. And so how did you end up here at the American Enterprise Institute, where we record and not serving coffee in a Starbucks, because isn't that what the liberal arts degree preps you for? Yeah, I, I started my thesis and I talked about free speech on college campuses. And I learned about Christina and Charles Murray and other scholars at AEI and uh, saw there's an internship. So I interned for Christina a couple years ago. And and yes, because you rem- I, you said Ella was so great. Yeah, so yeah. excited she's coming back. And now she's going to be my, my research assistant as well. So watch out, world. Yeah. Because I'm going to become efficient. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if we can take an efficient, Christina. You'll lose all your fun. No. You'll become me. I know. <laughs> you don't want to become me. The, the wh- wh- Carrying the whip. Um, all right. Well, we have... This is so exciting because we got word from our friend Molly Jong Fast. Actually, you have not met her. I have met Molly Jong Fast, who is, um, she's a writer. uh, She's a journalist. She also runs a a really popular (laughs) Twitter feed. She's like one of these, I don't know, Twitter artists or something who who get famous just for their Twitter feeds. And she's also the daughter of Erica Jong, the famous Fear of Flying, 1970s pro sex feminist sex sex feminist and she's here in dc with her mother and so we have a mother daughter team right she she let me know she was coming in a couple of days ago and i said well come on the show so they're going to join us today in studio which is amazing i can't imagine having erica jong as a mother i mean it seemed it would seem totally fun because she's so vivacious and and energetic. Although, but think of being a kid. No, in being a kid 70s. and in the 70s. Parents were not that attentive in the 70s anyway. Yeah. Let alone having a single mother f- four, married four times. I think Molly was the product of her third third marriage. And who's just a, you know, a sensational figure out on the seen yeah and a child at home you know and your mother's writing a lot about sex i think i've i've been reading molly i mean they're they're all prodigies i mean i think erica published her first book when she was 31 but her daughter published her first book when she was 21 and and that daughter is just an heir to literary royalty because her father her is gra- the, her yeah her grandfather son of right right uh, Howard Fast right the who wrote Spartacus. Spartacus and many other novels and then was blacklisted yeah and he was a communist and he was like a st- <laughs> like a Stalin as he, he got an award like from the Joseph end. Stalin <laughs> <laughs> to the end but I I picked up her memoir which she wrote at the ripe old age of twenty six it's called the Sex Doctors in the Basement which referred to the tenants, her mother, they had this brownstone in the East 90s, which then was not as glamorous as it is now. And um, That's putting it mildly. Putting it mildly. And they they had all these sexual therapists, psychiatrists who were their tenants. But she writes, I mean, this was just one of the funniest, wittiest, cleverest memoirs. Seriously, I've, I've read. And I mean, what a handful Molly would have been. She, I mean, she's obviously so smart and and completely embarrassed by all of her mother's sexual writings of the time as you can imagine so anyway i'm just thrilled they're coming into the studio this is super exciting um but before we get to them briefly um we have a few things right to discuss christina yes uh, you wanted to do some gwyneth paltrow bashing oh and i don't approve of that i like her I know. I, I like Gwyneth Paltrow, too, but I, okay, I, I haven't, 
brought up an article for a while from the Daily Mail, and you know how much I love it. And so I'm going to bring up an article from the Daily Mail, which was a very hilarious coverage by Liz Jones of the Daily Mail. She went inside Gwyneth Paltrow's thousand pound a ticket goop wellness festival, the first one held in London. Now, the thousand pound that was the that was the cut rate ticket. That was the cut rate because uh, you want to have the weekend pass, which was forty five hundred. Uh, for, the, for the Summit Warriors. Yeah, so that's pounds. That's British pounds. So that works out to something like... $5,668, if I my calculation is right. <laughs> Did you... I have a little my calculator <laughs> in my brain for that the British pounds. That sounds about right, Christina. Anyway, so for this, you got multiple seminars. She tried on, Liz Jones tried on, a, it's called an LED mask. You look like a serial killer. Imagine uh, what was the Friday, the th- you know, the hockey mask, oh, yes. but then lit up in red. That's what you look like. That is terrifying. But I you got to photo. do that. You got to walk out, work out, sorry, with a celebrity uh, trainer, Tracy Anderson. That's Gwyneth. You had, and they had breath, breathing therapists. They had breathing therapists. They had a plant based breakfast of vegan donuts and cauliflower popcorn. Ugh, I don't want either of those. And ever. I, and and and, it, and and anyway, it's sold out. 250 day tickets gone, 35 weekend passes cleaned up. And what it really made me think, um this looks pr- pretty easy to do, Christina. We should just have a femsplainer version like a Femsplain Fest. Festival. <laughs> and we could have seminars and we could, like, what What, what would we, well, we wouldn't offer cauliflower. No cauliflower. You would have caramel corn knowing There'd you. There'd be a lot of caramel corn. <laughs> and instead of detox, we'd be... No, pro, no detox. No detox. No detoxifications. Not on your face. You know, not in your glass. There'd no, be no, it would juices, be fun. No cleansing juices. No cleanses. No. <laughs> No. Nothing. We're not getting into those <laughs> topics of things no you beasting. put inside you. She has bee sting therapy. Apparently, it's good for your complexion to get a bee sting. Well, not if you're allergic. Horribly allergic to I bee was stings. Stung by a bee. Maybe that explains my glowy complexion. But, yeah, I mean, we could just um, we. I, you know, I, I, I think we should seriously consider it. We'd have to come up with. I mean, we could have like a whole room just filled with IVs for people who were hungover. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the IV cleanse for when you've drunk too Martini much. Martini workshops. Martini, yeah, cocktail workshops. We could do that. And instead of curated rose water or I don't know what else she has there, you know, various crystals and things, we could have rose. Exactly. All day. Yeah. Rose okay. all day. Okay, so we need to we need to work on this. Could you um, ask Ella to research that for us as part of her first research projects for you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, four thousand five hundred British pounds for the ticket. I, I you know, we about fifty-five. Well, we could just, you know, let's just charge five thousand. Okay, five thousand. Okay, that seems fair. Okay, and then we'll then we'll leave the podcast and go live in Mexico or something. <laughs> Okay. Well, you're not going to get a lot of millennial customers at your Femsplain Fest, unfortunately. Nice. At least according to a recent Washington Post article, which says that half of American drinkers say they'd like to drink less alcohol, but that jumps up to two-thirds of millennial drinkers. Uh, it's about apparently being a bit more present with your friends, connection. People really want connection, according to this article. Well, if two-thirds of them want to drink less, doesn't that mean they're drinking a lot? Oh, so maybe that's a good point. maybe they are a femsplain friendly group. Well, we My can sense. teach them every how time, to connect with booze. Isn't that what we used to call the cocktail hour? Yeah, yeah. And every time I have had parties for yes, right, for you millennials, have, you have your annual millennial party, party, and they come and they drink a lot. Yeah, they even into like the us, small hours of the night. Like yeah, amateurs. yeah. I was impressed. So I think that may not be indicative of being. Uh, Femsplain fest averse. Well, although um, I remember I had threatened to bring on this book in January called Sober Curious about a woman who had written about becoming sober. It was very worthy. It was January. And I think I, I trying, vetoed it. I think you vetoed it. I'm sober, it. curious, not. I'm, I'm not <laughs> indifferent. But, 
but it's become a fashionable thing. I noticed that she like does these like cool New York things. So is this is this Ella? Is this what this is part of these millennials like getting into their sober mocktail parties or? I have yet to be invited to a mocktail party, uh, but I do know people who don't drink a lot, but they tend to be health nuts. Yeah. Like they're the same who eat grilled chicken and broccoli every day and go to the gym for three hours. But, you know, apparently there are sober nightclubs and sober, sober early morning dance parties. What would you do at a sober nightclub? What would be the point? I guess you would just dance with yourself dancing with yourself. <laughs> no i don't know i i i you know this is i think have we're a now, seminar i think i think know. we're now dating ourselves now we're going to feel age we are going to become ab fab oh, you know God, we're this there. whole millennial we're there. generation is um is um saffy the daughter the uptight daughter oh millennials don't become our saffy but yeah that's that's uh that's where we're going with this but being can I just bring up a topic that is on my mind and it's more serious than anything we've considered so, so far is this today. on a sober note on a sober note which is what happened to my friend Andy No oh, in yes. Portland yes your he hometown was, oh not your hometown well I go there a lot and I know Andy very well and he's a a young journalist he is his family came here in the 70s from Vietnam and he, went, he writes for Quillette, right? He writes and, for Quillette. He's a photojournalist. When I spoke at, um, at Lewis and Clark Law School, yep. I invited him along just because I needed moral support, and he was a friend. But he was the one that took the pictures and the videos and then posted it on because the students, you know, were out where the protesters came and behaved outrageously, wouldn't let me speak. And Andy just quietly went around the room and documented it. I that would, he's also, I read that he's, like, he's he's small, like, he's, like, not some... He's small, and, and he's gay. about five, he's six. Gay. He's like, gay, and he is very soft-spoken, yeah. very gentle, yeah. and so he was brutally beaten Ugh. by a mob, just this enraged mob of, of Antifa, so-called anti-fascists, but they are fascists, and they wear masks and disguise themselves, and then, you know, it's not the first time they've attacked people. But in this case, it was all caught on video. It's shocking. I saw I saw the clip, and it was he was just standing there, and he suddenly these black masked um, people descended these on him. Goons just started to they punch him and kick him, and then they yeah. poured milkshake and more and took his camera, yeah. and he's just staggering away yeah. and probably you know completely traumatized. Yeah. And he has a, I don't know how serious it is, but he has some kind of a head injury. He had a contusion. Yeah. He had. A hemorrhage. The police didn't come quickly. The police didn't. Well, yeah. they don't. They stand down because they have this mayor, Ted Wheeler. And every time it's depicted in the press as if, oh, it's just like some right wing nuts came and then some left wingers. And it was just, you know, they had a fight. But that's not what's going on is there. There are some crazy right wingers there, but there are a lot of Antifa members and just hooligans that come out and beat up. Sometimes they just beat up people who are in cars, and this is on tape, but then it's sort of covered up in the press. They write about it in the Oregonian and the, the various newspapers, and then the national press just never picks it up. Now, in Andy's case, it has been on CNN. It's all over the media. But I was disappointed with some of the coverage and some liberal left-wing journalists who want to depict him as a, oh, he brought it on himself. He's a crazy right-winger. He's not a right-winger. He's a Yeah, he's a not Quillette. like Milo. Not that this would justify any well, It wouldn't violence. justify. I don't want to see anybody beaten up. Right, right. But let alone this small, sweet, you know, gentle guy who it was doing nothing wrong except doc. literally standing there. Like and he's brave. He goes to these events yeah. and films when no, very few other journalists would go and do that because they're it's scary. Well, an Antifa to the left is what I guess neo Nazis are to the right. Like it's it's nobody wants people to hear people different from them, do different views, and and they're violent. And um, but I would like to see more more repudiation from from liberal senators and congressmen and and in a, because this is this happened in do an you American feel that, that city. wasn't spoken out against enough. Not enough because it was a terrible thing to happen. In it's something you would. I don't know. You would expect to see in some kind of, uh, you know, d country that's, you know, with di under dictatorship and with goons going out. Well, remember the Turkish goons uh, exactly. during the early yes. days of the Trump administration yeah. attacked? 
uh, protesters outside the, I think it was the Turkish embassy. Yeah, no, it was that horrible. Was awful. And that was just like to see that on American soil. And this is very similar. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's pray, Andy. Yes, Andy. Okay. And we can ha- we'll have him come on sometime. Yeah, and talk, and, talk, and, and talk about this experience. Let's now bring on the mom-daughter duo, Erica and Molly. So excited to have them here. Erica and Molly, this is so thrilling to have you in studio. We have little Bet, who is Molly's daughter. She's waving. She's <laughs> waving. She's been told to be silent, and she's sitting in the she's back in a, a good swiveling girl. chair. She's, she's a very handle. good poet and storyteller. She's a very good and known for her quietness, I think, really. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> Hardly. Just shaking her we head have in three generations. Eyes. We have three generations, so this is thrilling. Um, I just want to say I've only recently befriended Molly, and it's just like a soul sister. I mean, it's just... Uh, and I've been reading her memoirs, and and they are amazing. And I can't believe she wrote them when she was so young, which we talked about, by the way, before you both came on. And then, um, and you have been a heroine. Like I read all your books when they came out, so I was I was reading your books as a teenager in the mid '70s, so wow. quite pretty yeah. early on. And I remember experiencing them as just this revelation. I was reading all of the sort of feminists of the time, like whom we would now consider mainstream, like Gloria Steinem and Nora Ephron, Mm -hmm. and then you. And it was so sort of heady and exciting. And then I, years pass, fast forward. (laughs) um, I start writing stuff about the fallout of the sexual revolution. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think we were on a panel together. I think maybe I think Tina Brown someone... was involved. And I think I bothered you because and I was... It was saying, your church lady it was phase. My, no, it was, it was, it was no, crazy. But I was saying like... concerned about backlash. I was... Con- no, I was concerned about... Hookups. I was concerned that there were now that this wonderful church sort of sexual phase. liberation liberation was leading to was a... fallout... <laughs> Which was annoying to say to you, and you were rightly annoyed with me. But then, but then now we're looking at a generation which isn't having sex at all, <laughs> and which has created these Germanic rules about sex, yeah. right. so they don't have sex. So this, they don't have sex but, because of the Me Too. But no one of the or, nice yeah. things about my mom, I will say though, just to get a compliment in there, is she's like she doesn't get. Like, she doesn't remember if she was, uh, you're, she's very unmad and very sort of... <laughs> no, maybe she's like me, like, I, I don't some, know. someone I don't maybe know. attacked I, you me and I don't remember. I am a middle daughter. Yeah. I'm a second daughter of a second daughter of a second daughter. And I don't hold grudges. Yeah. Even to, even for bad except, reviewers? Except there my... was one friend who slept with your ex-boyfriend. Oh, come on. That, you, you have to hold a grudge I, to that person. You know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to say who it is. <laughs> my friend who was, the review, who was the interviewer who slept with the ex-boyfriend who I think is actually gay. Whoa. <laughs> this went down a uh, he was rabbit hole. Very gr- he's a very good-looking, sort of fabulous guy, who? but... Angela? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be discreet. Uh, well, but anyway, she... Okay, Angela, but you should always you're out there, I'm available. ...who sleeps with an ex. But, <laughs> but, no, but seriously, so the change, of, know, the change of sexual <laughs> politics is weird. in that arc. So It's very so, strange. So tell us what you think. Have your politics changed? What, you know, My what do you think right now? have not changed. I think women need... A female desire has got to be possible... It shouldn't be indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. With me, it was never indiscriminate, despite the fantasy of the zipless fuck. And which was her your invention? That phrase, yes. But I, I, I like intimacy with people, with women friends, with men friends, and I don't want to sleep with somebody that I don't like. You are, you're, you're a bit 
you that may be the stage of life. Was that a okay way what? to say that? You may that may be big. No, you you were I think I think your original no. concept was there was this unleashing exuberance. Right. And, and women and, could be as wild as men right. and full of desire. And desi- and, and I wanting of adventure. Desire yeah. throughout history has gotten a bad rap. Yeah. Yes. And right. I really do. I mean, we desire we desire pleasure, just like all human beings right. do. Um, dopaminergic release, right? <laughs> pleasure. Right. We desire pleasure, but we don't want to be indiscriminate. That doesn't mean we want to sleep with any bloke, really. Right. We want intimacy and connection and humor and laughter and intellectual connection. Right. But we... Our desire has never been given its due. That is my view, and that view has never changed. But what do you think then is happening now? Because what I also loved about your books is this recognition that men and women love each other and should or can love each other and and should be exuberant with each other. Absolutely. And now it's it's like the Cold War or something. I mean, what do you well, sort of the see me, going me around? Well, the Me Too movement, I, f- I find the courage of it, it wonderful. But I think a lot of women, what they're getting out of it is all men are rapists. Mm-hmm. And that is not true. not true. All men are not rapists. There are men in this world who want to seduce you with music and words and read poetry to you. And, I, I, but they're a nice man. Right. But uh, You married a nice man. But that's not... I married I, a nice man. I married a nice man. But I don't know that Me Too is about nice men. That's a, I think no, it's me about too. power. Me Too is men about using men power using power. Diabolical manipulators right. and, and criminals. I mean, you think of Harvey Weinstein. Right. And Harvey Weinstein... I mean, what's interesting about Harvey Weinstein, my brother worked for him, was that... Um, that that was going on for such a long time and everyone knew. And everyone knew. And it was not and you know, he stayed at the peninsula because that was where he and there were he was right. w- there were he was involved with prostitutes, he was involved with this, he was involved with that. He was involved he was he's such a, a bully with everyone. Right. He right. would he would hit men. He was known yeah. at a board meeting to have thrown a whiskey bottle at his brother's head. Yeah. I mean, he, well, maybe that was... Does no, he, I'm sure. That was Jared Kushner's does, father. Does he talk to I can Bob, his brother? I, I think not anymore. Not, no, because yeah. also there was some suggestion at the time that his brother leaked yeah. all of this finally oh. yeah. to get yeah. control of the guy. It, yeah. It's so sordid. His brother is, from what I can tell, a pretty good guy. Well, no, it's well, certainly not. Know. Who knows? Not know guilty of this. Only superficially. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, but your point, your point, I guess, is what you're saying is, we all agree that Me Too, you know, is uh, we all exactly agree with what you just said. I think what is um, women were disturbing courageous. is that millennials are really not procreating. We've joked in the past, they're like pandas. I mean, it's like right. they're scared of each other. Right. They're not touching. You know, we have to get it's them ca- in that's cages partial together. social media, too. Right. They're yeah. not meeting. They're, or they're going you know, on these weird apps. But but tell us, like, yeah, so what, What? and Molly, you, you've you sort of seen this, too. Like, what I, is- I don't mind it. I mean, I think every generation thinks the generation after them is completely screwed up. Like, yeah, if you think about it, you know, you. that there's like... That, you I know, agree. they're either having too much sex or too little sex or this or that. So I don't I don't mind it. I mean, we have we're I think that the the you know, we are birth rate is going down, which is probably not such a bad thing. And which is a good thing for the environment. And I and I also just think that I don't know, these kind of things we get so stuck on this, like on this, that the next generation has it wrong. I mean, me too was about the you know trying to sort of women trying to take back the narrative of power in the office absolutely and so i think we'll see and they were very brave to do it but i think there may be yeah. like a course correction with uh millennial men though it's funny because i feel like the men who really are super careful are the men who never would have done in the first place right exactly. you know what i mean like the- I, I would just add one thing about the because i've thought about that uh, to me it I very much identified with sort of pro-sex feminism, and right. I, I loved your mom's work, right. your work. And 
Camille Polly and several other feminists. And uh, then there were there was Andrea Dworkin right. and Catherine McKinnon. And it, that was a very paranoid view of yeah. masculinity, of sexuality. It made it seem like a woman's body was just a crime scene. Yeah. Yes. And that was defeated, and it wasn't taken that seriously, and much more affirmative styles of feminism were prominent. But I feel the Dworkinism, McKinnonism, has come back. And that scares me a lot. And that, that really scary. scares me. Because that, and that is, and, and you know, that's the, nation, that's the natural conclusion of pensism. Is that, you know, and Trump it's is very a, conservative right. Right. And, and reactionary. Right. And it's not about being equal to man and no, liberated. It's, it's about not. being fearful right. and seeking protection. Yeah. So I see it as, uh, you know, a movement that's taking us back. That's that really worries scary. me with a lot of, you know, on the college campus. Yeah. So I hear. It worries me too. Talking that way, they were taught that. Up like handmaids. Well, but exactly, I, they are. It, 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 they're in full rebellion against their sexuality yeah. because they think, well, that me, if I'm sexual, that means I'm oppressed. So they, dress- well, that yeah, the whole message of enjoyment is lost. You know that that I don't know what parents are saying to their kids, right? That oh, you know, sex is a wonderful thing, expression between, you know, people who love each other. It's just fun. Is like I don't think anyone's saying that. I think I think it's like. Don't get in this situation with a boy, and don't, you know, don't drink too much, and check your drinks. My my two my younger daughters have whole roofie rules about, <laughs> you know, like if you leave a drink at a party, right? You that that drink is dead. You yeah, never well, go back. To I that think drink. That, I think the roofie thing is a bit of a. How myth. old are your daughters? Uh, twenty seven and seventeen. Uh huh. But I and, and that's like we never. My father that. said to me before I went to Florence to study Italian, the summer I was nineteen. He said. Never drink grappa with an Italian man. <laughs> That's my dad. And I, and I said, what is grappa? He said, it's a very strong drink. Never drink grappa. <laughs> also known as gropa. <laughs> right. But I, do, I don't think it necessarily, I don't know, I don't think it necessarily, I don't, I don't know that this is going to go down the way we think it is. Right. You know, with the anti-sex feminism, I think it's scary. I think it's coming. We've seen the writing on the wall. You know, you see, Mike Pence has one message, and you know, they want to get rid of abortion, but they also really want to get rid of birth control. You know, birth control is where this is all. And they want to get rid of pleasure. Well, and that's from the women. left too. Right. Right. But, but, but the what left. worries me is uh, when you have it on the women. left and the right. Right. That's yeah. and right. and I worry about a healthy center of liberal right. and moderate conservatives. And I don't think they've yet found their voice. We definitely they shouted need that. down. Yes. I think feminists, though, especially on the left, have to just keep a very pro-sex um, agenda and not go into that Andrea Dworkin stuff, which is dangerous. But, you know, luckily there aren't that many feminists. <laughs> so, there aren't I mean, yet. there's only, we can just what, ha- we can just tell them at the next meeting. You're I mean, absolutely like, right. I, and I'm being ironic, of course, it's not lucky, but like, you know, That's I mean, the anti-feminist true. movement, which is really scary. You know, women who won't call themselves feminists because they think it means something that, you know. if you That ask, it doesn't mean. Right. If you ask Tommy Lauren if she considers herself a feminist, I, I would, like, hesitate. I would be horrified to know what she would say. You know, a lot of the – so I feel like – But what's important to know is that throughout history, female pleasure has not been honored. And if you look at 19th century novels – Madame Bovary poisons herself. Anna Karenina falls on a train track. And you go back in history, well, perhaps in the ancient world, Sappho and Roman women were freer. But desire is a part of life. And you can't throw away um, pleasure. Absolutely. We are creatures who need pleasure. All right, let me throw then, exactly on that note, let me throw out another idea or another topic. Porn. I'm looking at Pat in the room. Pat, you need to go outside for a second. There's a child in the room. Yeah, my little 11-year-old. Are you okay? (laughs) I've heard some stuff. Porn. She's heard some stuff. She closes her ears. That's like, Beth's been putting her fingers in her ear. Okay. Porn. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. We don't need to get graphic. Can I I ask a discreet question about Porn. Okay, well, I was going to try discreet eyes it, and then okay. you can add. I'm just going to add that, that Fleischman is in trouble. Taffy Brodesser. Have you been seen that novel? I haven't seen to it yet. Seen but she's what? Fabulous. Who? She's a fabulous writer. And who? 
Taffy. Taffy brought us her acne, and she has a bestseller that everyone's yeah. talking about. Fleischman is in trouble. And this is about 30 and 40, or about 40 year olds. This man is suddenly divorced. And <laughs> We're he, opening frescas, by the way. That isn't beer. Who is yeah, this author? Fresca. Uh, Taffy, Taffy brought us her actor. You know her. She writes who? a lot. She Taffy. She's she writes a lot lovely. of uh, Good. profiles. Yeah, for Taffy New Yorker wrote us her and her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. That's great. But it, she, and she a, makes a lot of money, which got people very upset. Well, she's and a great writer. But right. This and they got book, very mad this book is about 40-year-olds okay. dating, and this guy is suddenly single. And these women that he's dating are sending him, how do I put this discreetly, with a child in the room, <laughs> close-ups of okay. intimate right. parts of their body. He's just bombarded. I mean, of course, this is, she's exaggerating, but... Um, you know, even though we have this sort of sex-phobic style of feminism in the universities, on the other hand, people are going crazy online. Mm-hmm. Well, with- this is about uh, one one of the stories I came across. I'm, I'm now, I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you, or I'm not going to remember where I found it, but it's like legit, that um, sort of uh, doctor's offices are starting to treat women who have shown up with injuries normally associated with sexual assault oh, for men who are overly enthusiastic Wait. and have watched a lot of porn. Wait. Because they so haven't they had co- sex in years. I don't or- know. It's just like, it's like, it's like that nice dentist you, you know, you went out on a date with and then he, and then he behaves and asks you to behave in a way that is okay. not that how you would normally do it. So it's sort of like this, maybe the, the misperception of what is a woman's desire from watching porn because a lot of people seem to now be getting I don't like porn okay tell us tell us why it looks like it looks like if I watch porn I'm always happy I'm happy that my mom never feels that she can't just bring it to the personal okay good good no I I hate no. You, you take after five wall. minutes of porn, just... I want to have sex, and after ten oh, minutes, Jesus. I never want to have sex again <laughs> as long as I live. <laughs> That's perfect. That's exactly right. <laughs> don't don't. Then it becomes that. Wild Kingdom don't or tell, something. Don't tell that to the girls at your girls. Okay, that that is <laughs> that is okay. Well, okay, let's let's move this to. Um, a, a, but can I, I say hope, one other. Yeah, of no. course. Yes. No. I hate. Branding. I hate the the fact that the older generation has to brand people born in a certain decade. Okay, they they feel the responsibility to call them millennials. Yeah, but that's or, and then to generalize about them. I don't think you can generalize about people. Well, they're trying. not because people who are born in one decade are not all alike. That is marketing BS, in my opinion, yeah. and I truly despise it. I mean, I hate it when people my age say, "Well, the millennials." Well, you just don't. You just you are preternaturally young. No, I mean, I was actually I was I was just la- like the the youngest older generations are those who do not succumb to that. Although I do think it's funny that my generation or our generation seems like is saying. You young people, you don't have enough sex. What's, what's wrong with you? You need to drink a little more. You know, like it's like the opposite. Where did that, that come from? Hilarious. Where did that you, come oh, from? Oh, I have a question that I want to ask Erica because before I read your novels, I read your poetry. Oh, I was in Paris uh, with NYU in Fruits Paris. Fruits and vegetables. My Half friend, lives. My friend brought some wonderful poetry books that was there, and I discovered it and was a fan early Thank on. Thank you. But I was thinking today. I've just published a new book of poetry. The world began with yes. Oh, I have. No. To, I mean, it, and I love it. And novelist. now the world begins with but no. A, right. <laughs> brilliant. She's a brilliant poet. Yeah. And I was thinking about what it would be like today to be a poet, short story writer, because we're living in this cancel culture. Yeah. Where what culture? Cancel, cancel, where you can be canceled. You can be, yes. you know, a mob will come after you because you dared to enter the psyche of someone of a right, different, right. you know, sexual preference or race or ethnicity. And I've read now that people that write fiction for the youth market, this they have to have sensitivity readers who will go through. I mean, it's like having the Catholic Church right. go through and crossing it's out true. what you can't say. Like what happened to Linda Fairstein yes. recently. Mm-hmm. What, happened? Um, what was that? 
Linda Fairman. She Fairman did. Good. She handled it spectacularly badly. She handled it badly. This is, a, this is so Linda Fairstein. Can she I bring? She was everyone? a prosecutor. She was a prosecutor on the Central Park Five. Oh yes, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, and and then she became a very successful writer. A mystery writer. Right. Yeah. Or, but she crim- really, no, I mean, stories. she should have. I mean, that was like, I actually thought Police that. Procedure I actually right felt like that was like Joe Biden. If she had just apologized and mm. said she had made a mistake and that, you know, she didn't have the DNA evidence. I mean, it was like Joe Biden with the busing. If he had just said, look, you know, we thought it was the right decision at the time, but we now know that it was not a good decision. You're absolutely and, right, Molly. But they he both... could have said, look, it was another generation. Right. And we I didn't, didn't like that it. attack. I thought she was kind of mean to him. and that he should... We didn't get it. He, but he it should be possible. He should have had a better response. He should have. He his response yeah. was. I mean, if you're gonna, if he, and that was Linda Fairstein too. You know, they went to Linda Fairstein and she said, you know, I did the right thing. And but forgetting you know. her for a moment because that's many people don't know that right. case. But but there are writers now. You can get in trouble if you right. write a novel, and you exactly. dare to have characters from that aren't your specific identity. You can right. only write about yourself. Or you are appropriating, right. or you. What are... does that do to fiction? Like, I don't know. It's not a good. And, time I mean, the good for news fiction. is that fiction doesn't. That fiction has is died. I mean, that's the bad news, actually. But um, no, there, I think it's very it's bad for the, bad, for art right now. No, it is very bad for art. Art because yeah. things yeah. are verboten, and you cannot make art if certain things are forbidden to talk about. Well, I think you. Can't, I, I don't agree. I mean, the pro, what's bad for artists is that people aren't reading novels anymore. Right. That is bad. But, I mean, but because they're not interesting. If people have to also know, be in TV this narrow, is really great right TV now. TV is really great. And, <laughs> and I think also, it's TV, too, because it's killing movies, too. I mean, I, and I also think some— Comedy? Of, right, right. What's happened to comedy? Cartoonists. But— I also think some of it is that, no, you're very, that we, right. the modern attention span has changed. That's true. And so it's so short we're that tweeting. we're not. You're on Twitter a lot. I'm on yeah. Twitter a lot. Yeah. Molly is a brilliant tweeter. Wow. Are you on Twitter, Eric? Yes. It has addled my brain. I'm worried it's about it. I think it's, yeah. I'm really kind of worried about I, it. I actually Molly's think it's art. made me a better writer. Very, very it, I mean, I'm not necessarily as long a writer as I used to be able to, but I'm I'm much more careful. I, I'm it's like writing a haiku. Words so you, matter so yes. much with a they tweet, do. and you can change the entire meaning of a sentence with a word. And, you know, I've made mistakes where I put, you know, accuser as opposed to victim or oh, victim. Know. You know what I mean? No, but, it, but it's so interesting to me the way that all of these words really matter. And so um, it's, it's I, I think it's made like me a lot better. It's writing poetry. Right. Every yeah. word has a valence. Right. Yes. And you, you really... And you learn how to use each word. The one thing I would say that I think is the failing of the genre is that you don't, there's no, I don't know why there's no weight placed on melodiousness. Like, I love right. prose that are very melodious where things read. Like, one of my favorite things to do with my kids was to read Dr. Seuss because I just love right. a very melodious prose. Oh, my God. I want to make my tweets melodious. Right? Don't you? And I, I've never thought of that. But I, of I feel like there's no value that placed that. on that. <laughs> I'm last <laughs> night right, you should. I went to a play with my sister at the um um Warner in DC or no, in, in New York or New York in New York at the um what is it the players club. Mm-hmm. And it was a play about the absurdity of people trying to modernize Shakespeare's English. Mm. And it was written by a playwright called Dykstra, and it was all in blank verse, rhymed blank verse. Yeah. And all the characters were debating whether we should modernize Shakespeare, and they were end-stopped couplets. It was so clever and so skillful and and ultimately very boring. <laughs> Too high I was thinking to myself. Okay. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I guess I want to. Um, well, let, let's let's. I just want to go back a little bit. Yeah, I'm not going to ask. Although, of course, I'm asking. Right. Like, you know, hey, Molly, how was it growing up in a house Half with way. a mother who's the sex yeah. goddess? Okay, we're not going to do that. You not least because Bet is well, here. No, but, but I want to. I want to 
talk about you Molly being as a had writer. A good, yeah, had a good girl. We can do up. it. Bet saying do it. Bet okay. said go for it. Bet, Bet is, I have promised Beth that I'm going to bring her on at the end of this. Okay, give good. her, so you, her you, give us just, her views. She's yeah. very articulate <laughs> and funny. No, no surprise right. there. Um, um, yeah. So, but as you as writers, I mean, you. Okay, so Molly, you've published. I'm. I. This is what I gather. Four books, three, three novels, three, three, three. Okay, because I one of the of... books is the same book with a different title. Oh, that's, how you know, which, that's really which, bombed. Uh, uh, that no. book we published with the a different sex title. Was in the basement. Why would that's a great? It's title. a great it, book. It got it sold so badly in hardcover that as like a as a hail mary they changed the title. Okay, but you, you are you are like that's something a prodigy. They used to First do. of all, you drive really, your mother crazy. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Yeah. You're the like crazy. only child. I'm reading this book, and I know there's a little bit of you know young woman snark in it. Oh. But you're you come off as like I'm just trying to hold it all together. Yeah. Single right. mother. Yeah. I'm I'm this like <laughs> celebrated oh, yeah. woman, and I've oh, yeah. I've got to like and 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 hey, we're going to tea with Joan Collins. Yeah, and I'm like right. writing about her. No, no, she and, and and you, but you, but like also to be fair to you, you're yeah. you feel, you know, you sort of go. At she 14, into drugs and yeah, yeah, yeah. thrown into right. therapy. Yeah. You have to get a well, hobby, so you take good. up horseback riding. Right, and, and then the horse. You get a right. pony. And the horse horse dead. Walk it. Yeah, that horse <laughs> died. Whatever. They but, lost. But, so all tell I can us, tell you tell us about that. The horse. Molly was so funny. When I she, really wanted yeah. that horse. And <laughs> we really, and that horse. When you yeah. were very little. I remember getting put, that horse. You put. Um, <laughs> and then that was the end of it. Of scotch tape around your finger. Right. And said. Look, mommy, sliver of dawn. Aww. What? And I said, Molly, you're going to be a poet. Yeah. And I remember telling my therapist, Dr. Mildred Newman. Yeah. Well, everybody had prominently, right? Everybody. right. No, no, but was that, was that Jackie Kennedy's? Yes, it was everybody. Uh, oh, anyway, and wow, nice. Mildred yeah. said, I'm okay, you're okay. Oh. My hunch is she's going to be a writer. And I said, how do you know? Mildred, can we talk about Mildred Newman for a minute? She was extremely She was funny. in a Woody Allen movie or something. Yeah. Yes. It ruined her life. Yeah. Well, she, was a re- she was hated because... Yeah, she was, was... She was... She, she, poor Woody. All right, well, no. Poor Woody. Now, don't we feel bad for him? I feel I mean, bad for him. He's being canceled and erased. I, I don't mean, feel at all he's bad He's made for a lot of movies. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, no, he freaks he, me out. He, he got made a way, movie every year. Yeah, he got way more than... Can you imagine the a talent, woman? The talent. No, his talent... He's his a guy. Talent. He still writes his movies. Yeah. I'm sorry to digress. On a typewriter. And when you watch his movies, it's like the internet hasn't been invented. Right. I mean, he's like yeah. so in a bubble, that guy. I mean, some but of those movies what? were great, he's but... not a bad person. But, um, he is not a bad, but not a know bad him? person. Yeah, we yeah. both... Oh, okay. He's also yeah. a okay, distant so cousin of my husband. But, but, you know, once a year, Woody takes us out to dinner. And Woody used to be... Where do you be, go? Where do you go? Santa. Oh, who Santa knows? Meta. I can't. Remember, <laughs> um, um, where they don't take reservations but, and they have an account but, so they can overcharge. Okay, and they have but the best Woody truffles. In the world. is a distant cousin yeah. of Ken, my husband, and Ken's uncle was Abe Burroughs. Was Abe Burroughs who named names? My grandfather was Howard Fast, who did not name did not names. name names, but who anyway, was a communist? He w- well, man, they all you know, were. Uh, no, my that, parents, they uh, all were I'm communists. All and didn't disavow every... Stalin until like 1982. <laughs> but who, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little late, a little right. late. He's and like, and got they, the Stalin Prize. Yeah. And you know, one time, <laughs> um, Howard got on the Fifth Avenue bus and ran into Lillian Hellman. Ah. And Lillian said, I forgive you, Howard, <laughs> on the Fifth Avenue right. bus. Okay. Can you believe it? Yeah, they were so mishugana, all these York people. Story. <laughs> They really were. Oh, okay, but so, somehow, okay, now oh, we, we, digress. Digress, we digress. We digress. Beyond digress, beyond digress. Yeah. I was going to ask you where, about Wait, 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 where were we? Writing. Okay, okay. okay. And, then, and then you, so you're this, so you, you have serious issues? Yes. And then, but you come out of it in your early 20s. Yeah, I got sober when I was 19. So I was like wow. a very big drug addict. My grandmother was a pretty... Bet's eyes. Bet's eyes are... What drugs? You know what that? drugs? Drug addicts. Drugs, what, what drugs? What was your That drug? must have been cocaine. It's your age group. Cocaine. Oh, cocaine. God. Um, but my grandmother was... I tried it once and nothing happened. Which oh. grandmother? 
You mean my mother? Was she a was a spectacular <laughs> alcoholic. Yeah, and I mean, I would like, say that one alcoholism one. and addiction run, run in, in our family. family. So <laughs> okay. anyway, I was right. very into cocaine, and then when I was about nineteen, I thought I'm going to die. Like I'm just going to die. So I was a freshman at one of the many colleges, Barnard. I had dropped out of Wesleyan. No, you were at Wesleyan. At Wesleyan. I dropped out of Wesleyan, you were at Wesleyan. and I was at Barnard now. It was, get it? You're dropping out of pretty fancy schools, if I just may it say. It was in the 90s. It was and much then, easier to get into those And then you went schools. to the Gallatin Division at NYU. But, but I would just, oh, so God. she was about to give a speech, and I was in the car with her, and I said, I'm a cocaine addict and an alcoholic, and I have to go to rehab right now. And she was like, I'm about to go and give a speech to like 300 people. Yeah. A and I was like, I need to go now. So, and okay, she was we like, went... can I just do the speech and then we'll take you to rehab? Do you remember? <laughs> I you remember very. <laughs> and then we went home <laughs> and we called Hazelden. Yeah, we got. And they didn't have a bed. Well, this I had is a, a rehab center. Yeah, a rehab. And then. But you saved your own life. That's good. I your called. Yeah. Help. I called Judy Collins, who's a dear friend. Wow. And I said, Judy, you have to get us into this. You have to. And her son at that point was the director of publicity for Hazel of admissions, (laughs) not a mission recruitment. And And I I called Center City and I said, Judy, it was a very busy time at Reno. You have to get a bed November for us. 1997. She's got to have. This was November 1997. 1997. We went to November the airport. 1st. We got on yeah. a plane to yeah. Center City, Minnesota. Nice. And nice destination. It was, there, too. Is that where you're going to be? Is that where you're going to be? I thought it was in Malibu. And when no. we got. That's like the good one. Oh, my when God. When we got no to one. Center this is like City. The Jane Eyre one. Yeah, right? this there one was is like the one where they. Cold like, and dark. They have and... the swimming pool, but they won't let you use it. <laughs> they just. It's all just like group Was therapy. it reform school? It was like. It was. I. It was. You know what? I had never been anywhere where people were like, you're full of shit. Mm-hmm. And right, it, everybody me, always said you're so brilliant. It was amazing. Like I would be like, but you don't understand. I had this, and they were like, no, we understand. Like, shut, we shut can up. We completely have your number. That's good. And yeah. It was amazing. And but at, liberal parents in the '70s and they, they couldn't they right. couldn't tell you. To but you know right. what was they great? Could, and they were very tough. And it was a really cool experience. And I had Thanksgiving there, and it was like. And they came and visited. All my family came. They were my step. My father is a social work professor, so he was very excited because yes. he got to learn lots of stuff. Right. And uh, my mom <laughs> came, and she got to. She had. There we was went a guy in the who family sawed program. off his arm, and that got her very. <laughs> He was very oh poetic, God. that guy. Remember that yeah, guy? Yeah, you found him, I'm sure, like, on his like, And there's a guy with no arm. He's <laughs> Why did he saw it off? It was cocaine amazing. Or, or but, heroin. I don't, okay, but I don't so even you, know. So, okay, so you're going through this, which, yeah. is, which is terrible and awful. And I, you know, as a mother, like, what was interesting reading your memoir is I'm now at the age where I've seen it from both sides. Right. right. Oh, yeah. And you were just trying to hold things together and... And yeah, you're going to a speech. Like, come on, Molly. This yeah. is this is like brand new. Well, mom here. is like super. She's not like that. Like, I, if it were me with one of my kids, I'd be like, okay, you have to shut the fuck up. We'll deal with this in two hours. But my mom is like, oh, darling, how did I fail you? Oh, which is really sweet. And she's like a very supportive mother. And her mother was really, really mean. My mother was a hard. I'm a little more like her mother. <laughs> like, was your yeah, mother really like, mean? Really? No, mean. my mother was. I mean, which my mother, Ida, Ida, Ida right, threw Ida. up an alcoholic. in I mean, all like, people, the five-star restaurants all over the world. Yeah, where, where, where was, where was she from? Or her parents from? Where did um, her parents? Her Kiev. parents were Kiev Russian Jews. Jews. Russian. Right. We're all Ashkenazic Jews, but very anxious, when, anxious. When, and my you know. grandmother and grandfather came from Odessa. Mm-hmm. Well. They didn't. They came from Grodno. But it was like but the, the, they was grew the, up in Odessa, it was and then very the, anxious Jews who came over in the 1800s. Like they were like, we see the writing on the wall. <laughs> this is not going to end they well. They were the for most us. prescient, right? Yeah. Well, they were the most anxious, and I yeah. think honestly, like, and we are all anxious, really anxious. And all my grandparents were born in this country, except my grandmother was born in England, and I always think about that because I think. Like they really self-selected the most anxious people. No, they say like the the Jews who were optimists 
ended up in Auschwitz. Right. The pessimist, the pessimist Hollywood. You are, you know what? You're so absolutely right. My husband is an optimistic Jew. My husband and I have a great um, difficulty. He says, the legal system will bring Trump down. And mm-hmm. I say, fascism, fast, law, slow. Um, mm. I think the that voters should be would a bring bumper him down. Sticker for the, <laughs> and I say, fascism <laughs> moves fast, law moves slow. Yeah. You've right. got to go to the court. You've let's, got to argue. Let's get, them back to, let's get back on. Okay. I, I just feel like I now just want to just yes. name, drop names and Please. hear your story. Yeah, yeah let's drop names. Go for it. Let's go for it. Yeah. But, but, okay, so... To your Go writing, on. so you're no well. He's Lillian Hellman, I always thought she, she called was. you fat, but she, I wanted to get the Henry Miller. Don't call us called you fat. Henry Where Miller. are you? Okay, Henry okay. So I met Henry Miller because this yeah. came on, and we had to actually shut you guys down and say, "Could you not talk till we get yes. on the podcast?" We, you know, okay. So you are this brilliant young woman. You're writing these books, and you are very supportive. Like there's no yeah. how did you I, meet Henry competitive. Miller? Will you tell us the story? I tell you the how I met Henry. Um, and then lead it into your reviews. Okay. But anyway, Henry. Henry was given a copy of Fear of Flying, and he got really excited by a friend, a friend in California, and he said, "She has written the female Tropic of Cancer. Yeah. Mm. This is right. amazing." And he wrote an essay for the New York Times that was about how the female Tropic of Cancer has been written by this young poet called Erica Chong. And it was published in the New York Times. And they called me up and said, please write a counterpoint about Henry Miller. And I wrote an essay, and they published them together. I wrote an essay about Tropic of Cancer and why it was important. It was a man talking about sexuality in a very open way. So I went out to California to work on the movie of Fear of Flying, which has never been made. I was going to say, I don't remember the movie. I remember seeing it. Julia Phillips. Okay. My producer was insane. She was a coke addict. She was always picking up young coke addicts. I went out to California and Julia was completely bonkers. But I, I went to Pacific Palisades and met Henry. And Who was Hen- he married to then? He wasn't married, but he had a whole bunch of kids. Post, um, post, post. Friends of nice his kids knit. living. No, no, that was a long well, that time. That was a long time before. Before. But Henry was living in Pacific Palisades at 444 How o- old was he then? Ocampo Drive. He was 88 years old. Mm. And the house was full of young people who adored him. And I went out and met him. And we spent hours talking about Paris in the 30s, his writing, Anais. Anais was gone by then. Yeah. And... We spent hours talking, and I was fascinated. With and his... you later got attacked for defending him. I remember in the, like the New York well, Review of Books, because you didn't call out his sexism and objectivity. Me too. And that right. still happens. But well, you, you know had... what? He I mean, was watercolors. Didn't he give you watercolors too? He gave me many Uh-oh, watercolors. That's always a sign. <laughs> no, <laughs> Henry was eighty-eight. I was thirty-five, that and makes... had just met my father. Mm-hmm. And I was with Jonathan, who she had left her second husband for. I had left um, Alan Jong for Jonathan. Jonathan rented a beautiful, crazy old house in Malibu. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to be together. And mom went to Haiti to get a divorce. Dominican Republic to get a divorce. Right. This is my Dominican divorce. That's anyway, right. you could that's a whole other... Then without the other spouse even knowing it, right? Yeah, right. But, but that but was a whole Henry other... Miller, when I your daughter published these brilliant <laughs> novels, a novel and memoir, he, you got... You got I trash, got which well. Is, uh, you were not first, trash, but you, there were you know, many young women yeah. who were Molly's I age. I don't know that that's who true. I wrote was... shitty things 
and I, said, if she weren't God. Erica Jong's daughter, this terrible so novel. Jealousy. I mean, jealousy okay, and so envy. There was one really mean review in the New York Times that was really mean. Really. And okay, tell us the reviewer, and, I, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll like. It was a Twitter mob. It was, my Twitter mob. No, you can't Twitter mob. No, her because joking. Now joking. she follows me. Oh. No, and I have to tell you, I was like, when it happened, I was like, Who is she? I'm not going to say. Give but us a hint. Was, I'm going to look no, it up. It, you can look it up, but not. you can't look it up right now. I won't. Which is good. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was a mean review, but it was, I don't know. It, you know, in some ways, it wasn't. There's something great about having mean things written about you, like very liberating, because people are so afraid of that. And when something like that happens where, I mean, this was like really one of the mean, it was such a mean review that my ex-boyfriend so... called me to see how I was doing. I know, oh when the friends God. call like, no, are you all right? Ex-boyfriend who Ooh, had jumped horribly oh, no. was like, I just want to make sure you're okay. Oh, my, my mother, God. my Jewish mother who has like a, you know, uh, a voodoo doll of you was worried about you. <laughs> and, you know, and, and but Henry Miller gave you the best advice, it seems, about bad reviews. Henry used to say, I would say, these reviews are so hurtful. He'd say, why don't you take it as a joke? <laughs> <laughs> he was a Brooklyn boy, right? And he said, don't take it serious. Why don't you take it as a joke? And I said, but Henry, it's so painful. He said, don't tell me about painful. Take it as a joke. You've got a sense of humor. <laughs> and you know what? I would tell that to any young writer today. And I made a promise to myself that if I was ever in a position where I could help young writers, I would do it. Well, Molly, did you end up taking it as a joke. You know, I, I mean, I haven't written a book in a while, but I I get my fair share of static in, in the world. And I don't... Yeah, you're, you, on, know, you're a... You I deal with a it very well. I, I deal with it pretty well. I mean, I you don't... You do. I you deal with like, it extremely well. I don't mind... I don't mind taking abuse for my political views. I, the, there was one time where Junior came after me. Oh, that fuckhead. Junior? And, yeah, Trump Junior. And, oh. like... He He's all my Instagram, but he like all my Instagram for like three days was you cunt. Like they have uh, all the same. That, that's now pacing now, behind you going, uh, like, oh yeah. my God. They're, and they're, that, Trumps are but, so stupid. But that was Junior. I think Junior has the like scariest follower base because, yeah. I mean, I don't know who Eric's fan base is and Ivanka's people are sort of more pretentious or think of themselves as more but Junior's people are really like pro gun hunting hunting well, great pictures yeah. and they want to kill you I mean hopefully and when I read that be. stuff I think <laughs> my mom my is really don't. worried but the thing is now Marianne William fan, Williams fans want to kill me Marianne, Marianne Williamson <laughs> fans want to kill me she's because why she's I wrote so a peaceful piece and about her in, zen, in the no she's not I wrote a piece for her in the bulwark and they were really offended and they, they want to kill you yeah they were like oh. she doesn't get Marianne at all I was like no, no one does okay like, <laughs> well, we have to wind this up because by the way oh, I could just started. sit here I have so many nine thousand years it is Thank so much God. fun I mean, no no but we I, okay so I have one question unless Christina oh, yes one's sad. and then we promised to bring Beth on because she's yes. been bouncing around like a little that Mexican so... jumping bean she's the she best. wants to say something can I not say I Mexican you... jumping bean is that like where no, you are in trouble it, it's a, what's, what's wrong with a Mexican jumping know. bean they were, they were toys they were toys they're toys they're toys okay they're toys. okay anyway okay never yeah. mind you're bouncing around like a kid who needs their Adderall. Okay. Yes. That's modern. <laughs> no, she's um, not. No, no, she no, was. No, but she was in the back. But, okay, so I want I want a couple things. Just, okay. So I saw, Erica, I have not read it. I would have had I had more time. But you've gone from fear of flying to fear of dying. Right. So give us your look back. This is, a, you You had a book, I think, 2015. Which right. I'm now going to go read. Because who and is it? By the way, <laughs> who is it? <laughs> Washington Post put it on the list of best books to read. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm right. I am all over that right. this which summer. Which made me when you're sixty, which is like it was but not so, a book for people who were sixty. So, it, think so they did a very funny. Usually, people say the hundred most important books, and here they said 
what do you read when you're one? What do you read mm -hmm. when you're 61? Which was very clever. Right. And when you're 61, you read Fear of Dying. And okay, so, one, so what was your, just give us your um, back of the thing blurb and your sort of wisdom now, because you have gone from Fear of Dying to Fear of Dying, as we all are. And t just tell us what brought you there. What brought me there is, I think, unless you acknowledge that you're mortal, no wisdom comes. Mm -hmm. You you have to say, okay, I'm writing, but I'm mortal. I don't know if my books will survive, but I do the best I can. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I listen to Don Giovanni, my favorite opera, and I think Mozart wrote this with Lorenzo da Ponte's libretto, and I could listen to it every day of my life and never find the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And he died at 37. His body was thrown into a grave of paupers. And where is his soul? Is it spinning in the heavens? Mm -hmm. I swear to God, Mozart is my ideal of what it means to be an artist. He was not revered in his time, but he left us some of the great works that we want to listen to again and again and again. We don't know whether the world will survive, whether our work will survive, but we do it because we must. Mm -hmm. I think, by the way, fear of flying, I'll read fear of dying, obviously, but Fear of Flying is so due for a revival of this generation. Oh, my goodness. That they need to rediscover. I know pleasure. Beth's, Beth's at the mic. But but pleasure and desire and And just female liberation. And female Not, liberation. Do you and know that Fear of Flying has just been um, translated into Arabic? Oh, my Ooh. God. And Mandarin. That is, but Arabic, Arabic is, is so huge. interesting. It's interesting. And from time to time, I'll get a call from an Egyptian journalist who will say, "How did you, how did you dare?" Mm -hmm. And I keep being invited to Pakistan to literary conferences, <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I say. Jewish girl from Central Park West, not comfortable going to Pakistan. <laughs> I think Pakistan is, is mm. the best. But I'm curious. I think Pakistan yeah. needs you. You're yeah. Pakistan curious. Yeah. I'm Pakistan. <laughs> totally. All right. All right. Bet. Bet is going to take her mom's. We're, we're ceding the balance of her mom's time to Bet. Bet, just say your name and say how old you are. Uh, my full name? Yes. Yeah, fine. Go ahead. I'm Beatrice Jongfast Greenfield, and I'm 11. Okay. What you've been sitting in the back of this studio, I've been watching your facial expressions and trying, because this is a pretty tough thing for you to have to listen to your mom and your grandma, grandma talking about these kind of edgy Embarrassing things. Talk. So what, what's your opinion? What's your opinion? Well, number one, you don't get by with your ears super sensitive about stuff if your grandma is Erica Chong and your mom <laughs> is Molly Chongfast. <laughs> My twin brothers swear a lot, I swear a lot, and I am honestly don't really care. A lot of my reaction is just the theatrics. The theatrics? <laughs> the theatrics. So, so, so uh, you write beautifully. How many what? books do you read a day? Oh, uh, well, you're going to put us all to shame. I read a book a day, but it's not really entirely true. I just like to read. Okay, so that's wonderful. So, and I think what is, you're going to be a writer. I think we have. Do you think you're going to be a writer? Are you just going to join this? Fourth, yeah. 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 Well, it doesn't pay as well as I would like. So I want to consider <laughs> other career options and writing as a side because I definitely do enjoy writing, but I don't think I can keep it up consistently enough. You're Whoa. Absolutely this right. is like a woman of self knowledge yeah. at 11. And, and, and save this tape. Because they're going to want it for posterity. That, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, you that, you heard her here first. You is this your podcast do? debut? Is this your yeah? Is this your podcast debut? Uh, I think so. Unless there's some embarrassing tape of me running around screaming while mom <laughs> in the background while mom does something important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bet. Well, here's to you, your generation. Let's hope you can get it right, 
And thank you. Nobody else got it. Nobody right. else got yeah. it right. Yeah. Nobody got it can, right. And I think Bet can. And, and uh, thank, thank you. you, thank you, all three of you for being on this podcast. This is I could just go on forever, but we are so it. excited to be here. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a riot. That was fun. They're so interesting, and I. I just love that it's this mother-daughter duo. And I think it would be fun to have a famous mom. Would would you want to have a, Wait a minute. You did sort of have famous parents. <laughs> sort of like you haven't... Have I persuaded you to watch that show, Huge in France, with the comedian God? Mm-hmm. Which is so... I just love it. It's so funny. There's only been one season. But, you know, I feel like my story is huge... In Canada. Um, <laughs> but my stepfather was very, very famous journalist and um, an editor and founder of uh, the Toronto Sun newspaper. The, and, um, and my late mother-in-law was David's mother, who was, I mean, she was on a stamp. I mean, she was one of the most Barbara famous... Frum. Legend Barbara Walters of Canada. Yeah, and like Barbara Walters and Walter Cronkite like just together. rolled yeah, into it. She right. was she was huge. And both David and I, so we came from sort of separate political backgrounds because his mother was very liberal and my dad was one of the conservatives of Canada. But we both had that it was a small media world in Canada and we both had this experience of growing up at dinner tables where you met fascinating people. And it just seemed to be a natural part of your childhood landscape that things that you just met constantly really interesting people. Now, to be fair, neither of them <laughs> were writing about sex or about you <laughs> or about me. Uh, like, I could see that if your mom was, you know, this. If they ignored Sex you, person. that could be distressing. Yeah, but and if, if they, they were nice to you and took you places, I would feel privileged to which, do that. Which she seemed to have done, but you know, it's 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 she was she was a single mother, and she it and was the Molly 70s. was an only child, and yeah. Uh, but but anyway, no, I think I mean I think it all. I think David once went out coffee when he was much much younger and the daughter of a, um, another famous broadcaster of Canada, and she goes, how do you cope with it, you know? How do we get by without becoming drug addicts? And David was like, <laughs> I, I really enjoy it, actually. <laughs> Did she have the wrong customer? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, all right, do we have time, Ella, for quick listener reaction? We do. Okay, good. So we have some listener feedback to our episode with Sam Harris. This comes from Twitter. Uh, and this is in response to Sam describing his early relationship with his now wife, Anaka, and how she kind of ghosted him for a few months. So uh, this man says, but I dislike how ghosting is considered a perfectly acceptable thing for women to do. And then Anaka couldn't judge herself for that sh judge for herself that she liked Sam. She needed the endorsement of a friend. Sam said this in a previous podcast. And then Anaka needed the social approval of others to take a look at Sam. Just reminds me of female nature and really annoys me. Whoa. Oh, boy. Well, you're uh, he, he's a bit of a pill. He, he may be in his mother's basement <laughs> writing this, no offense. He doesn't First of all, like I, he's a great experience with women. She, we don't, it wasn't literally ghosting. ghosting. Maybe they had a casual meeting and then it No, it he, took a he, while. Yeah, he said she kind of ignored his, his he, outreaches and things for about six months. And then we joked that it, he'd been ghosted. But first of all, I'll just say to this Twitter follower, you know, it's not acceptable for anyone to ghost. I mean, I know it's become this term, but any sex, I don't think women get away with ghosting any more than men do. You know, that's, I don't think there's a double standard of ghosting. Right. Um, it's just bad, you know, in, in, in the it's class. It's bad manners. It's bad manners. But in, in this case, I, I saw other Twitter remarks where uh, people had um, taken offense. There was a whole ugh, Twitter battle between not this man but someone else about uh, how, you know, a man should never pursue a woman. It's humiliating. Um, and 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 I, 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 what, I replied, what? I said, this used to be known as courtship. It, the whole... it, it used to be known as what's, what, you know, what's nice about life, <laughs> being pursued, pursuing, all and, of that. 
And have it, didn't we read, uh, sorry, didn't we learn from like books, one of my favorite books, if you haven't read it, He's Just Not That Into You, which was written by one of the male writers from Sex and the City, who, who when they'd have their weekly writers meetings, all the women would come in and they would start complaining about their weekends and how they were pursuing these men. And men did not want to be pursued. So he wrote this modern young man, a book called He's Just Not That Into You. It's a Bible for dating still. I would recommend it to our female listeners. I don't know. I think yeah. that might be dating you. I think in the Me Too, men who pursue women are well, looking dep- for well, no. a cancellation, a life annihilation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think his point was simply, you know, that if he didn't, and it's like the old Dorothy Parker waiting by the phone. Um, if he doesn't call, if he's ghosting, if he's not, he's not reaching interested. out, He's just not interested. He hasn't been hit by a car. Because you know, he hasn't typically suddenly. Typically, men cancer. don't play games, and they're not thinking right. it through that way. They like you; they're there. And I, right. And he had one example was my favorite. He this was a guy who I think he was in the military. Met a girl in a bar. He really liked her, and then using, but he got no number, you know, nothing. And he like using sort of military intelligence, for sort of pre you know his early days of internet, managed to find her. And he and his point was. He likes you, you know. He, it will be obvious. So I thought, you know. So I, I think this was. This listener was just. I mean, I, I, I worry this is an attitude, amongst young men that they're, as you say, they're afraid of cancellation. You know. Well, they have a right to be confused, and yeah. du- and it, and there are double double standards. But moving on, do okay. we have a more affirmative inquiry? <laughs> uh, I think so. So this is also in response to Sam Harris's podcast, um, and. Nathan says, hello, ladies. I discovered your podcast late last year, and I haven't missed an episode since. I'm also a huge fan of Sam Harris, so your last episode was a treat for me. I guess your audience overlaps with Sam's more than you think, since you both provide interesting and heterodox content. There's no need to worry about tailoring your content based off speculation over what your guest audience may want to hear. Keep doing what you're doing and feel free to share the interesting and wacky stuff you see in here so I can relay to my wife all the food and liquor people are putting up the wrong hole. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were worried that our we had, we were but Sam Harris fans, if you've stayed with us through this episode, welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we hope we haven't put you off with all of our low-minded... Low-minded, rather than mindfulness, low-mindedness. <laughs> <laughs> low, low mindfulness. Thank you, Nathan. Glad to have you as a listener. Was there anything else? Yes, there's one more item. Uh, so this comes from Lana. It's also in response to the Sam Harris episode. She says, I found your fangirling over Sam Harris amusing but unwarranted. His podcast is one I regularly don't listen to, although I subscribe. I've dated enough philosophers to be unimpressed by the breed. I much prefer the more down-to-earth stuff that you provide. That said, opening with weird news items about sex or vaginas for shock value is getting a little old. I love your show for the perspective you provide as intelligent, educated, and worldly women. Talking about sex with potting soil isn't necessary to draw me in. Well, she should meet the the first guy. (laughs) Twitch, the one who doesn't. We can have a dating service. (laughs) (laughs) There's no, there's no, I think there's no winning with that one. Uh, I mean, no offense, Lana. She prefers us to Sam Harris. I'll take that. Yeah. And no, not everyone likes, you know, they probably, we've discovered, but some people really like potty and soil. (laughs) The garlic, you know, cure. Right. Never mind. Let's move on. We'll move on. We'll try it, Lana. We'll, we'll, try, we'll try to assume a more high-minded. And look, what we didn't get into with the Goop conference, and certainly at any Femsplain Fest, there would be none of that. It would be... We, we Maybe Christina could give lectures and tutorials on on Moliere. And, uh, oh, uh, she doesn't uh, like philosophers. She doesn't like philosophers, Christina. Well, I can do rel- religious figures. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do one. All right. Well, Alana noted we'll um, we'll try to avoid some of that. But anyway, all right. Well, thank you. I think that's it. Thank you all. Uh, Again, welcome any uh, listeners of Sam Harris who have managed to stay with us this far. And uh, thank you. A big shout out to our 
Patreon and we gather supporters. Um, you guys are keeping us alive. Uh, we, we, we're still not making our books, you know, uh, our book, what do you say? We're still in, we're still in the red. And we're not quite in Gwyneth Paltrow territory. Yeah. I mean, if you guys will pay $5,000 a pop to hear us, to, to booze with us, we're, we're there. So no problem. Um, (laughs) But other than that, we truly appreciate all your, um, support. And we also, uh, want you to like us on Facebook and no, no, not Facebook. Yeah, you can like us. On yeah, Facebook and Twitter and too. Follow me but, on Twitter. But but the main thing is, is we appreciate your support, and you'll get uh, secret content, secret content, including we did with Andrew Sullivan last week. So anyway, thank you and goodbye. Au revoir. Hey, thanks for listening to the Femsplainers. Stay with us by following us on Twitter and Facebook at Femsplainers, and on Instagram at Femsplainers Podcast. You can always email questions and comments to contact at femsplainers.com. We read every one. We are poured at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. And thanks to AEI Research Assistant Zoe Appler, who is our production assistant here in the studio. And thanks to Nat Frum, our audio and video editor and occasional millennial mansplainer. And listen to us on pretty much any of your favorite podcast platforms. And please remember to subscribe and like us at iTunes if possible. Every like helps us keep our solid five-star rating. Cheers.